Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Investors Bank, Fedway Associates Inc., Verizon Communications, Berkeley College, Barnabas Health, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. More importantly, it is my honor, my pleasure to introduce the First Lady of the great state of New Jersey, Mary Pat Christie, who is the chair of the Hurricane Sandy New Jersey Relief Fund. Good to see you. Great to see you, Steve. Um, we're doing this program right before Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. just a couple days before. It is a time for a lot of people to give thanks. It's, a lot of, it's also a time for a lot of folks to think about others who are suffering mm -hmm. and dealing with the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy. The new Hurricane Sandy New Jersey Relief Fund. By the way, throughout this segment, you will see that website. There's a reason for it. Tell everyone why that website is up and what this organization is. Sure. Well, thanks, Steve. Um, so my husband asked me to chair this, this effort. And um, the Sandy New Jersey Relief Fund is going to really focus on New Jersey and really try to help where uh, insurance checks and FEMA checks run out. There'll be a gap. And we would like to be there to help people rebuild their homes and rebuild their lives. You know, I'm sure a lot of people were thinking this um, during those first few days. You said that the governor called you on a Thursday, mm -hmm. I believe it was, mm -hmm. yes. after the yes. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Did you, I mean, you know him better than mm -hmm. anyone else, I would imagine. Did you anticipate that he was going to say, Mary Pat, we need to do this? Sure. Well, it's certainly his nature. Um, he's a really compassionate person. and I think that New Jersey and the country saw that as he walked around these towns that were absolutely devastated and really embraced people, literally embraced people. And he would come home from those days just, A, exhausted, but emotionally spent and knew literally within two days that we had to try to spearhead something to really focus on New Jersey and really try to help the people that were hurting so badly. You know, let's make it clear to folks because there are lots of other great organizations out mm -hmm. there, American Red Cross and Salvation Army, so many great organizations. This is different. And I want to make sure people understand this is a not-for-profit, a 501c3, yes. that's yes. its tax status, mm -hmm. right? Yes. As we do this program, you're building up, I hate to use the word infrastructure because so much of the infrastructure has to be built up in the mm -hmm. state. You're building up the organization. Let's make it clear. People log on to the site. They want to give. And by the way, to date, I believe it's close to $17 million. Uh, yes, it is. Very close. Mm -hmm. And while there are some very big checks that have come in, I also heard you talk to our colleague, Mike Schneider, over at NJ Today. Right. Just last night you did the program. And you're talking about lots of smaller checks coming to the website. Make that clear as well. Sure. Well, that's been really exciting for me. We have this website where people donate, and we also have people from all over the country mailing in checks. Uh, I told a story, I think, about a lemonade stand of this, these three-year-olds in California. And their father said, I'll match it two to one. And they sent a check in for 700 plus dollars. And we have over 7,000 donors on our website, last count. And that actually, I need an update. That was a day or two ago. How does that feel? Really gratifying, really gratifying as the First Lady of New Jersey, because I have to tell you, the letters we're getting about people's days, de summers spent at the Jersey Shore, just really tug at your heartstrings. They really do. You know, um, your family spends a lot of time down the Jersey mm -hmm. Shore. In fact, some of them have been publicized, those trips. You can't even go on the boardwalk without folks following you and, right. and uh, taking pictures and the media being there. But for you, you and the governor and your four children, mm -hmm. that's a big part of your lives. So beyond the governmental part of it, beyond the fundraising part of it in terms of mm -hmm. what has to be done now and using all the cachet and the relationships to do this, what, are, what does it mean to the Christie family personally to be involved just in terms of the shore part? And there's so much more involved, but just right. the Jersey Shore part. Well, I think it's given us a resolve because it is so important to us and we've spent so many days and summers at the shore, we really feel like we want to build it up for the state and, you know, build back stronger. 
I know my children want to go back on a roller coaster. Right. And, what did they say? I'm sorry uh, for interrupting, Mary Pat, but what, what did they say as this was happening? No, I think that they were just as stunned. And it, as you continue to see the pictures, it really becomes ingrained into your, your head and your heart that I can't believe this has really changed so much, so dramatically. And I even said to Chris, well, how's the boardwalk at Point Pleasant? You know, we see all the pictures of Casino Pier in Seaside, but um, how's that boardwalk in Point Pleasant? And you know what? It's, it's probably just as bad. So it's going to be a real rebuilding for the next eight months and, and hope we can uh, have some, some fun again next summer. You know, it, it, the fun for us, those of us who live up north but vacation down there, right. it's one thing. But for those who their lives are there, right, it's very different. Right. What, as the governor has come back to talk to you, and he's been face to face with so many of those people and has provided a degree of leadership beyond, beyond the governmental mm -hmm. response with the state and the federal government and the coordination and all that, which is complicated enough, but the human part of it. Has there been a part of this in him th that has in any way surprised you in terms of the human interaction that he has shown the compassion for those mm -hmm. folks when he, you can't solve their problem, but you can give them a hug and you can they're right. crying on your shoulder. Is that any of that? Oh, that's so him. That's and him. It's, it's certainly a part of Chris that I don't think people have really had an opportunity to see. There haven't really been um, these situations. I mean, Hurricane Irene certainly brought that out to some extent, but nothing like this. And um, it certainly didn't surprise me. Uh, and I know that he's a very comforting person. He always says the right thing um, when, you know, even if there's a, a death that uh, military service people have had, um, you know, he really knows and never hesitates to call the family and make sure that they know we're thinking of them. Uh, he's really good at that. And the other misperception I think that might be out there is that so many of these shore towns have really become full-time residents. Um, Seabright is a perfect example where right. there's, I believe, 800 residents 1,800 residents, and in the summertime, it swells to 20 to 30,000 people a day. Um, so those people are really, their lives are turned upside down. So those are really the people that we're so concerned about. And, and before I, we end the interview, I want to make it clear. <clears throat> There's going to be a process, mm -hmm. Mary Pat, where people actually submit Right. Their applications, mm -hmm. grant applications. You're setting up a process where there's going to be professionals yes. who review those grants, mm -hmm. who make tough decisions, right? Sure. It'll be a competitive grant process is what it's called. So um, and we already have policies and procedures in place. I have um, you know, a professional staff, probably going to be about four or five people. Uh, there'll be an operating board. Uh, that will really end up approving all of these grants. But it's going to be very professional, very efficient. Uh, I am a person with not a lot of time, so I've already warned everybody that we're going to do this process um, you know, transparently and um, really make sure it's done right. And the role of United, former United States Senator Bill Bradley in this is very significant. Yeah, no, I was thrilled that um, Senator Bradley agreed to be the honorary vice chairman. And all of the people that are on this advisory board, there's so many great New Jerseyans. Sure. And um, we still have people calling us saying that they want to help. And I think to lend your name to this effort really says a lot about the people of New Jersey and how important the state is and how much people want to help. I mean, it's a, it's a real tragedy what's happened here, and uh, I'm not going to let people forget about it as long as they'll keep listening to me. Yeah, you know, finally, while some very large grants have come in, sponsorships, uh, mm -hmm. million dollar range, half a million dollar range, uh, they know who they are and they're not looking to be recognized here. One more time, a pitch to all of those who have five, 10, 50, $75, whatever it is, they go on that website, which has been up the entire time. Mm -hmm. They go on, make a commitment to those folks that those dollars are going to a good cause. Let them know. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, um, and it will. I promise to be a really good steward of their money because uh, we, we need it, and I don't take it lightly, the responsibility, and I, I promise to, to do the right thing with the money. Being fiscally responsible, we're all yes. in on that one. The First Lady of the Great State of New Jersey, Mary Pat Christie, the Chair of the Hurricane Sandy New Jersey Relief Fund. I want to thank you for joining us. You're making a big difference. Thanks so much, Steve. We're all in this together. This is Steve Adubato. We'll be right back right after this. Many people throughout the state have been devastated by Hurricane Sandy. If you'd like to make a difference, you can show your support to the Hurricane Sandy New Jersey Relief Fund. Visit their website at sandynjrelieffund.org.
There he is, Patrick Dunnigan, Chairman and Managing Director of Gibbons PC. Good to see you, Patrick. Nice to see you, Steve. We've Thanks had for you having this, me on. We've had you in the studio many times, but this time, one of the big reasons we have you is that you are the Grand Marshal of the Newark St. Patrick's Day Parade, which is taking place on March 15, 2013. It's a Friday in Newark, downtown Newark, March 15th. It's the 78th annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. Let's talk about this. First of all, why, there, there's a lot of history to the St. Patrick's Day Parade. What is the history and why is it important for you in particular to be the Grand Marshal? Because you've had some history there. Absolutely. It's uh, the 78th parade in Newark. As you know, my firm, uh, Gibbons, was founded in 1926 in Newark by Andrew B. Crummy. And the first six partners at the firm were Crummy, Gibbons, O'Neill, Murray, Moore, and Dolan. All those Italian guys. All, all those <laughs> Italian guys. And the reason why Irish guys went to Mr. Crummy's firm was because they couldn't get hired right. at any other firm. That was the culture that our country was in in, in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. They, they couldn't access the, the white shoe firms. Sure. So they went to this sort of Irish firm. So our, we have a long history in Newark, 87 years in Newark. And we thought that this was a great way to celebrate Newark and Gibbons' tie to the firm. So the theme of the parade is Newark past, present, and future. And as part of the parade, I've brought together business and civic leaders sure. from the city to march with me as my personal aides, that's what they call it, uh, so that we can celebrate the, the city and get everybody out, get mm -hmm. all of the, the businesses in Newark, Horizon, psc and &G, Prudential, and all of the great civic organizations like NJ Pack, the Newark Museum, the schools, you the law on schools. You serve on the board of NJ I do, I do. I also serve on the board of visitors at Seton Hall Law School. And uh, Dean Hobbs, Pat Hobbs from Seton Hall, right. is going to march with me. And John Farmer, the dean of Rutgers Law School, is also going to march. You're bringing them with together. Me. Absolutely. Well, you know, Patrick, what's interesting is I, we have a long history with uh, Patrick and, and the firm. Um, I've done some coaching there as well with some of your folks. And I know that, that there's a tradition that you have at Gibbons in connection with the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Talk about that. Yes. Well, Mr. Dolan, uh, Chuck Dolan, everyone knows uh, as a legend in the New Jersey bar. And he started celebrating St. Patrick's Day at the firm many years ago. And around 3 o'clock, a bagpiper <coughs> shows up and marches all around the six floors that we have in Newark. And then we have all of our, our staff have corned beef and cabbage and, and boiled potatoes and rye bread together starting around 4 o'clock. And of course, there's a keg of Guinness and a keg of harp and a, the Baileys is out and, and, and it's just a great time. And there's, a, there's always a baking contest during the morning of St. Patrick's Day. So it's really just a wonderful celebration of Irish heritage. It's a big deal. I'm going to ask you about Hurricane Sandy in a second. We'll shift gears dramatically. But, but I need to know this. As an Italian-American, I know that uh, Columbus Day means a lot. And, and awards in connection with that and the celebration means a lot, ethnic pride. What does this mean to you personally to be the Grand Marshal? It's a tremendous honor for me and for my family. I grew up, I have my, I'm Irish descended, four grandparents from Donegal, Offaly, Mayo, and Sligo. And so every St. Patrick's Day, we'd be celebrating with the Irish music and of course the corned beef and cabbage. And uh, just to be recognized as part of, of Irish culture is a really big deal for me and, and for my family. Mm. Hurricane Sandy, we were talking before we came in here, we just, previous segment to this, First Lady Mary Pat uh, Christie talking about the, the hurricane relief fund uh, set up in the state. Talk about the role that you've played in that, the firm's played in that, it's sure. important. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the morning after the storm, uh, one of my partners got a call from, from the governor's office and asked us to help out. And we set up the Hurricane Sandy relief fund literally that day and had it up and running within <clears> 24 <throat> hours and the, the First Lady is one of the trustees of the fund. Another trustee is, is my partner, Bill Palatucci. Right. Uh, and we thought that it was really important to do that quickly and, and, and pro bono, of course, to, to help the citizens of New Jersey recover from this devastating storm. And at Gibbons, we created a task force to deal with the legal issues that businesses are going to face, insurance, regulatory, and of course, all, all of the, the, the business issues, contractual issues that they need to wade through. So we assembled a team of lawyers to address those issues. It's a personal thing too, though, isn't it, Patrick? For me, it was. Yeah, uh, well, you but, and I have talked about yeah. this, because we're, we're, we're Jersey people, we're, our businesses are based up here, and, I, and again, for so many people, it's their primary residence down at the Jersey Shore, but in all candor, you and I spend, sure. we talk about this a lot, we're we, Jersey Shore people in the summer. That's right, we both, we both love La Valette, yeah. and La Valette was, was uh, hit very hard, not, not as hard as some of the other communities right. on the Barrier Island, but uh, yeah, it, a, a lot of my partners also have homes down, in, down at the Jersey Shore, and, and they, were, they were uniquely impacted, you know, just the not knowing of what yeah. happened, you know, two weeks later, not, not being able to have access to your home 
and uh, you know, there's a lot of people who, who suffered. So finally, before I let you out of here, the legal industry, the business, I mean, you obviously, you're looking to make money. You're looking to, to be out there competitive in the marketplace, right? We understand that. It's all of us have to do that in, in this industry as well. You have to be, you run a successful business is how I want to put it. But the other side of the equation, you do spend a lot of time. I don't want to turn it into a commercial for you guys because, you know, that's not what it is. But I do know you spend a lot of time thinking about the other side of the equation, doing the right thing. Sure. It's not just words. No, Gibbons Cares is an important part of our culture, of who we are. We give away a million dollars a year as a law firm to the community, to various charities. The Newark Parade, in fact, has a huge component of charitable giving. Yep. The beneficiary, mm -hmm. the primary dedication is St. John's Soup Kitchen. We're going to be giving money and donations to other charities in Newark that we care about. The Boys and Girls Club, Christ the King High School, the Newark Museum, mm -hmm. NJ Pack. So that's a big part of our culture, and, and this parade is an extension of our charitable giving. Right out in our green room is uh, someone who represents the St. John's Soup Kitchen coming in here for an interview, so it's all somehow connected. And uh, Newark's a great city, but there are a lot of needs, and that's why it's important that we're out there doing the right thing. Uh, Patrick Dunnigan is the uh, Grand Marshal of the 78th Annual Newark St. Patrick's Day Parade on March 15th, 2013. Mr. Grand Marshal, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Steve. Good stuff. Really we'll be back. Appreciate it right after this. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at caucusnj.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato and we are coming to you from a studio you may not recognize. This is the Rutgers University ITV studio in Piscataway, New Jersey, and I'm pleased to be joined by Patricia Costanti, who is the chairman and chief executive officer of MD Advantage. Good to see you, Patricia. And nice to be here, Steve. I'm glad to catch up with you here at Rutgers. Um, let's talk about national health care reform. We're doing this program right before the presidential election of 2012. We don't know who was going to win that election, but the status quo is not an option with health care reform, right? Right. I think as we look at health care, the major issue is really economics. It's not an issue of who wins the election, but can we afford the health care system that we currently have in place? And what kind of changes do we need to make so that it is more manageable from a national perspective and more manageable from the perspective of the physicians who are working within the system and people like you and I who have to buy health care coverage? Now, Patricia, MD Advantage deals with, represents of physicians in terms of medical malpractice. So the question is, what would national health care reform mean to physicians, number one, and number two, to the physician-patient relationship? I think right now what most physicians are struggling with is, as they think about national health reform, what they think about is reduced reimbursement to their practices. There's no other way to say it. They're going to be paid less for what they do. So they need to begin to think about how to build sustainable practices. And they're looking at that from a variety of ways. Can they become more efficient with more technology? Can they merge into larger groups? Do they need to become employees of larger systems? Mm. Those are all the changes they're dealing with. And each one of those changes has ramifications for the patients they take care of. One of the things I worry about is physicians telling me I'm learning how to use the electronic health record. I have no choice. I'm learning how to use it. But what it means is that when you are the patient in my office, I really can't make eye contact with you because I'm filling in the data fields. Excuse me. It's that. Uh, you, you, I'm actually, people talk about national health care reform, and it's very um, esoteric. Now you're getting very granular. It's the actual process of inputting this electrical, what? electronic information. I can't look at you while I'm doing that but I want you to look at me. Right, and because there isn't enough advance in things like voice recognition systems, a lot of physicians feel they can't have the patient interaction and then deal with the medical record system because they need to keep moving to see enough patients Excuse me, to have think, a sustainable practice. Sorry for interrupting, Patricia. Do you think the government, federal government, recognizes this as an issue for physicians, but more importantly for physician-patient communication. My sense is it's viewed as a learning curve. And while that may be true, 
The learning curve is a steep one, especially for mid-career or older physicians, and it has a very real impact on things like their liability exposure. If I have an, an interaction with you and never feel like I've made a connection with you, it's an awful lot easier for me to find fault with my care and sue, as opposed to someone who I feel like I have a very meaningful and close relationship with, and I know you did the best you could for me because I felt it in every instance that I met with you. It changes the dynamics drastically. At the same time, and I can't comment on the science, but at the same time, there are so many changes in the recommendations that are being made. PSAs, probably no longer necessary. Those wellness visits that women needed to have done every year, you probably don't need that mammogram. You might not need that pap smear. It puts a physician in a position of counteracting everything a patient has believed and leaves us feeling, are you telling me that because it's true or are you telling me that because it's expensive? Hold on. Is the economic part of this part of the national health care reform that says keep your costs down? I think that as a country, we're looking at keeping costs down. And as a result, guidelines are changing. As a patient, it's very hard for me to discern what changes are driven by economic realities and what changes are being driven by best practice in medicine. And I think for that patient who doesn't have this year's mammogram and then winds up with a breast cancer, it's very hard to say it wasn't economically driven. And that damages not only that particular patient-physician relationship, but I think it changes the way we view the entire healthcare system. And you can see that in countries that have national health services. Patients are much more mistrustful of the care they get. And in many cases, either buy up to levels of insurance, concierge levels of insurance if they can afford it. And if they can afford it, they leave the country for other levels of care. And I think those are all the things we will be struggling with as we move forward. We need changes. I'm not sure the changes that are coming down the pike are the best ones in the short run. I need to ask you this in the limited time we have left, Patricia. The physicians that you deal with, that you represent, what advice do you give them right now, mm -hmm. given the fact that these changes, they're, they're happening, okay? What advice do you give them? And in turn, what advice do, do they give their patients, given the fact that these overwhelming changes are taking place? Among the things we do is we try to work very hard to help them manage their practices in the smartest, most efficient way they can. Most of the physicians we deal with are coming to us saying, I don't want to be an employee. I want to be able to have a self-sustaining practice that I own. How can you help me do that? And so we work with them to bring in the practice management efficiencies that help them along those lines. The second perspective is we ask them to be very conscious of what is the standard of care in your community. There may be a new national study that's changing guidelines, but is that the standard of care in your community? Pay attention to that because that's what a jury mm -hmm. will pay attention to if you wind up with a malpractice claim. It's a difficult, difficult time to be in And be finally a physician. for their patients. It's funny because you were just talking about how to protect themselves as physicians, but finally, for their patients. What they need to be able to do for their patients is step back and practice the best medicine they know how to practice. And I worry about the fact that the business aspects of providing care sometimes take time away from the clinical aspects mm. of providing care. And that's where we really need to encourage our physicians to keep their focus. Have someone else manage the business of your practice. Pay attention to patient care. Only you can do that. Trish, let's agree to this, that this is an evolving process. There are no surefire answers or lots of questions. And uh, you'll join us again and continue to give us this important perspective, particularly on the doctor-patient relationship, OK? Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. Patricia Costanti from MD Advantage, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Now let's continue the conversation about this and other important topics and issues on Facebook. 
visit my page at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. N13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Investors Bank, Fedway Associates, Inc., Verizon Communications, Berkeley College, Barnabas Health, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, The Star Ledger, and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Since 1865, we've sought to deliver the very best possible medical care to the people of New Jersey. Today, you'll find that mission made real in every facet of the state's largest healthcare system, with world-renowned doctors using the most advanced technology and techniques, pioneering a new path to better care. We are Barnabas Health, a new name for the next great century of medicine. Barnabas Health, every day extraordinary. This is One on One. Join me as we get up close and personal with some of today's most compelling personalities. This is one you can't afford to miss. Weeknights at 7 on NJTV and 1230 AM on WNET.